degrees. They'd sort of they'd done all the coursework before, but this was the first moment they could have actual degrees. And so this October, there is a 100th anniversary event planned. And so I'm crossing my fingers that by October, we're able to do something. Or maybe we'll all be so good at Skype and Zoom by then, we can just do it virtually. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that that does happen. Such a milestone, and it needs to be celebrated. Yeah, I agree. Well, Mo, we thank you for taking time to talk with us. Stay safe, stay well, and enjoy the rest of your day. And good luck with the Agathas. They are still going to give out an award. That's right. Thank you. And yeah, same to all of you. Do you have a website where people can find your works? I do. Yeah, it's just momolton.com. Very easy. All right, Mo. Hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Dorothy L. Sayers was one of the pioneers of mystery novel writing. Her Lord Peter Whimsey was a great character on YouTube. A lot of the old Lord Peter Whimsey television programs you can go back and watch, they're still very good mysteries, and I recommend them. And I really think it's interesting to go back and hear how these writers got their inspiration, especially these ones that we can't interview because they're not around anymore. So it's nice to get to hear where Dorothy got her inspiration. And it's interesting to see the struggle for equality that they had to go through. They paved the way for a lot of what we can do today. Yes, I feel that they did so much for us. Fortunately and unfortunately, we've made great strides. Obviously not enough. There's a long way to go. What I found interesting is that Dorothy and her friends from college remained such close friends all their lives. I don't think that happens often, although I do have a friend who has a very large close-knit group of friends from college. He's the only other example I can think of. Because we, you know, move on. We take different paths. It's unusual, I think, to stay that close throughout time. The one thing they had was their love of literature and just their mutual admiration for each other. Mo Moulton's website is M-O-M-O-U-L-T-O-N.com. And, oh, interestingly, there is a mutual admiration society quiz on the website so check out that website and all of mo's goings on and their book everything you can find out about mo and the mutual admiration society next up is francis schoonmaker born in lawton oklahoma francis and her two brothers were reared on a farm her parents were farmers and school teachers as a child, she was fascinated by stories told by pioneer grandparents and exploring the remains of the dugout where her mother was born. After teaching elementary school for a dozen years, Frances directed the graduate elementary and middle school teacher education program at Teachers College, Columbia University. She has taught, lectured, and consulted internationally and holds degrees from the University of Washington, George Peabody College, Vanderbilt University, and Teachers College, Columbia University. She resides in Baltimore, Maryland with her family. The Last Crystal is book three of the trilogy of the same name. When they board the LA-bound Santa Fe Chief in Kansas City, the four Harrison kids have never heard of The Last Crystal or the magic surrounding it. Worried about their father, who has been injured in World War II, they dread a summer with their boring old Uncle James. But before the train is halfway to L.A., J.D., Mary Carol, Robert, and Grace crossed paths with a Nazi spy, and one of the four has been kidnapped. Then, without warning, they find themselves off the train, drawn into a quest for the crystal. To get home again, they must cross 2,000 miles of wilderness and find the crystal with nothing to guide them but their wits, each other, and an old map that only the youngest can read. We would like to welcome Frances Schoonmaker, who is an Agatha nominee for the Best Children Young Adult Award for her last Crystal Trilogy. Welcome, Frances. Thank you. It's great to be with you all. Besides The Last Crystal, you have also written the Sterling Poetry for Young People series. Which genre, poetry, or fiction do you find more personally satisfying? The books of poetry were a work of love. I was delighted that I could contribute to a project that would 
have children and young people engaged with poetry. But on the other hand, <laughs> the trilogy was a work of love. I think that's kind of like asking which of your children do you like the best? They, you know, they're different. I love them both. The last Crystal trilogy sprawls over a hundred years of American history, which includes both the world wars. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you needed copious amounts of research. What did you find especially challenging? In you mean Russia? besides everything? <laughs> <laughs> there are several things. First, we understand so much more about history and what it was like in each of the periods that the trilogy covers than we did when I was a child. And I wanted to be true to the newer scholarship without falling into characterizations of people that are stereotypical. If you think about how people talked about each other, for example, it's the trap that Laura Ingalls Wilder fell into, reflecting the culture of her time and what she heard, whatever her own feelings were. And that's a tough one. It's very hard to do. And I'm fortunate that I had training in historical research, but that doesn't make you immune from tripping over the pitfalls. I actually started out by writing the third book first, and The Last Crystal is the book that was the nominee for the Agatha. I wrote it first based on an idea I had. When I finished it, I kept thinking, well, how come this happened? Why did it happen? in that way. I wasn't satisfied. I happen to be fortunate enough to have a daughter who's a literature and theater major. She's been a teacher. She kept saying to me, well, you've got to have a backstory. You know, any good actor knows that if they're going to be authentic, they have to understand their character's past, even if it's never mentioned in a script. So I started thinking about the backstory. And because the third book, The Last Crystal, starts out on the Santa Fe chief train right during World War II. I thought it would be interesting if I started with the Santa Fe Trail and the Great Westward Migration. Now, the thing about the trilogy is it has a couple of themes going on at once. One is the fantasy theme that follows through all three books, and it has to do with what is the last crystal and how did that happen. I did the first book on the Santa Fe Trail, and then I thought, well, a nice place to position the middle book would be World War One, and I wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. One, I had some really good family stories from that era that I could draw on it to help me be more authentic. And then two, I guess you could say I'm a pacifist wannabe, so I thought it would be interesting to explore pacifism and how German Americans were treated during World War One. It turned out to be particularly interesting because I discovered that the model for the internment camps for the Japanese was actually based on what happened in World War One. So I had this great idea, but it didn't fit the timeline. So I moved the first book up as far as I could move it without running into railroads, because initially I had positioned it in 1843 before the gold rush. So I had to get over the gold rush and try to push it as forward as I could, and I really couldn't. So I ended up fudging in the preface to the middle book, The Red Abalone Shell, I point out that I have moved the timeline up as a matter of convenience because I felt like I needed to say that not only just for the casual reader, particularly for the children who would be reading that. And I wanted them to know that I knew I was doing that. <laughs> that part was a challenge, getting that timeline right. I guess the other part was then revising it because I had to redo book three once I had book one and book two completed. Those were the big issues, but there was another one that was, say, was more of a niggly issue, and that had to do with getting the details right. I made one mistake. I'm sure I made more than one, but I mean one I know about that I noticed after book one had gone to print, and I just thought, ugh, and probably nobody will notice it, but I notice it, and it had to do with the detail. In book two, I had it all written about Mama in the story, is listening to the radio. Well, then I discover that, you know what, people didn't listen to the radio during World War One. It was just being developed so that it could get out to home. So I had to reframe that in terms of them using the newspaper. So it was tremendously challenging. That's what makes it so much fun, trying to get the details right. So those things work out the timeline with the story in a way that was authentic to characters without falling into the stereotypical trap, perpetuating them. And then the 
corner I painted myself in by doing the first book and not realizing I was going to have a trilogy and then having to align things. And then those little details were what were the most challenging aspects that come to mind. Well, now that the trilogy has ended, who in the series will you miss the most or will you continue writing so that you can continue your relationship with this family? I did leave some doors open. There are some growing edges if I decide to continue with the series. Again, this is one of those which is your favorite child questions. I really liked the character James, who actually goes across all three books. At the end of book one, we see him as a child. He isn't the protagonist. You can see that he's going to be picking up the reins, the fantasy quest that underlies the trilogy. In book two, James is the focus. The book begins when he finds himself on the steps of the church and is found without the least idea who he is, except that his name is James, and he has a red abalone shell in one hand, an old map in the other, and a dog is with him, and the dog's name is Old Shep. And then in book three, James is the boring old uncle that four children are going to have to go spend the summer with because their father's been injured in World War II, and their mother needs to go to England to help nurse him in one of the hospitals for Air Force pilots who were downed during World War II. So he turns out to be not so boring, but I did grow very fond of him, as I did really of all the characters. But honestly, I think the characters I miss and will miss the most are the real scalawags, and they're Ruby and Junior. We meet them in book one when Grace, the protagonist, is a young girl setting out on the trail, and they're in the same company, and they just make her life miserable. Well, they grow up to be really nasty outlaws, so why did I fall in love with them? Well, I was thinking as I was working on the plot, and I'd gotten well into it, that the first book, The Black Alabaster Box, was just so heavy, because in trying to be authentic to the new scholarship, this was not a camping holiday, where we all go out and have a great time. Inconveniently, we occasionally have attacks from Native Americans. It was a grim and often tedious experience for people, and it was heartbreaking. So I wanted to tell that part of the story without being violent or feeding that thirst for blood that we seem to have in so many stories that we expose children and young people to. I kept thinking, I've got to have some comic relief here. I was actually having a little writing retreat at my brother's in Kansas. That did two things. I got to see him. It got me away from worrying about if I'd cleaned the refrigerator. It also got me close to the Santa Fe Trail. I think in my biography, you mentioned that I was reared in western Oklahoma. The territory that these books land in is very, very familiar to me. And I've made many trips out to the West Coast by car and then by train as I was doing research for the book. I was sitting at his dining room table all by myself in the house. Suddenly there they were. And I just laughed out loud because they were in some ways so wily and cunning and other ways so just completely laughable. So then I recreated the first part of the story and included them as twins who were in the same company as Grace. And later, they're really horrific. I think one of my favorite chapters in the first book is chapter 22. It's called Another Set of Twins. And it's where they pick up the empty black alabaster box. I can say that without giving away the secrets of the box. And they look at it and they're just speculating about what it is. Well, they end up selling it to a snake oil salesman. You know, it just was very funny. Although they end up doing some really despicable things by the end of the book. I pick them up again in book two. Again, one of my favorite chapters in that book is chapter 15 where they have a shootout with the Dalton brothers. That one was fun because I make Ruby the one who gets tired of always being discredited because she's the woman, but she's the better shot, and she's actually smarter than her brother. That book, the way that I end up staging that, I just enjoy a lot, and my granddaughter, who's 14, has enjoyed that part. In that book, they change in ways that are surprising, but there was no place for them in book three, and I thought, oh no, (laughs) what am I going to do for my baddies? We have the immortal baddie who runs through all three books, real people baddies, (laughs) and so who am I going to have if I don't have Ruby and Junior. You do have these characters flying around your head and they become like a family. There is a sense of missing them when you finish. But as I say, I did leave the door open and we'll see. Good. We were very disappointed that Malice Domestic was canceled this year due to the coronavirus and a chance to attend the amazing Agatha Award Banquet. What will you plan to do to celebrate if you win the Agatha Award? Of course, you mean other than repositioning the floodlights that are on the tip 
teapot shaped blimp over my house so that <laughs> it no longer says nominated but says one. Nice. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Seriously though, I think I'll probably be a little less dignified than if I receive the news at Malice because as you know, you don't really know who the winner is until that banquet. And so you have to be prepared to either quietly sob or graciously walk up to the podium and accept the award. Actually, if I were to win, I'd probably jump up and down and cheer and we'd probably all dance around in the living room and saying, I'm proud of you like Mr. Rogers, proud of me. So we'd be less dignified. I think the next thing would be to post on social media what I might have said.